What, ready to go. Okay, uh, I'd like to welcome you all to another index in not in the human index in transformation seminar series. We're very pleased to have Michelle Mejo Mejo uh, from the University of Yaoundé, who is currently doing his PhD in sociology, and he is working together with our own Professor Simon Becker. And he's already received his doctorate. He's already received his doctorate. So, um, so Dr. Mejo Mejo has worked on a um, on the influence of ethnicity on border trade and is focusing on the city of Kea Osi in southern Cameroon. And he looks at um, how the same ethnic group on the borders of, of Cameroon, Gabon, and Equatorial Africa um, are involved in various forms of trading, informality, and smuggling. And the title is Sellers and Buyers in a Vibrant Border Town of Border Town Market. And Professor Becker, who you probably all know, is our own emer emeritus professor of sociology in the department, and his interests are over many years have spanned questions of collective identities and ethnicity alongside um, migration in South Africa and more broadly in Sub-Saharan Africa. His recent publications include articles on religious and urban identities in South Africa as well as on xenophobia and he has edited a book on capital cities um, which focus mostly on Francophone Africa. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so there are many other things I could say, but um, including that um, he was earlier a professor of development studies at Rhodes, then at UNISA and UKZN before coming to Stellenbosch. He's also held visiting appointments at Oxford University, as well as at institutes in France and Sweden. So, and you're currently at STIAS or about to go to STIAS, is that correct? So this is a jointly authored um, article, largely based on the PhD research of, of Dr. Mitchell Mitchell. Thank you very much. So 40 minutes, and then we'll open up for discussion. Thank you, Stephen. No, thank you very much. And I mean, let me apologize on behalf of Michel. I phoned him yesterday. He was in Yaoundé. He said he was in his village today and there was no connection with his village. So he asked me to apologize on his behalf. But I do believe the, the seminar and the discussion is going to be um, recorded so we can let him as the main author have a recording of the seminar and of your questions and uh, points of view. So as you heard, the, the, the research was done by him, Michel Mejo Mejo. He received his doctorate last year. His focus, as Stephen put to us, is on a town called Kie Osi. Particularly, his research was on the role that ethnicity played in market activities, and I present on his behalf. And let me just underline that the research he did in Kie Osi was completed just before the arrival of the COVID pandemic. This paper that I'm presenting to you has been submitted for publication um, two, three months back. Now, the town of Kie Osi in southern Cameroon, and I'm going to show you a moment where it is, is close on a map, is close to the international borders with Gabon and with Equatorial Guinea. Cameroon has a population of about 25 million, Gabon two and a half million, Equatorial Guinea, which used to be a Spanish, one of the very few Spanish colonies in Africa, has a population of one and a half million. These three countries belong to the Central African Economic and Monetary Community, CEMAC, the equivalent in Central Africa to SADC. It's a community that today shares a common currency, as we do not in SADC and as the West doesn't. We have different currencies for the different members of SADC, whereas here they all share a separate, a, a similar currency, the CFA franc. 
and they share a number of economic policies, as does SADC, that apply to all six members. I'm going to show you a map in a moment of the countries of SOMEC. For example, and it's an important example, no visas are required for SEMAC residents when crossing SEMAC borders. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't need papers. They need to show that they are part of one of the six members of SEMAC. But if they show this, then they can freely pass the border, which clearly is not the issue in, it's not the, the case in SADC, as we know in terms of what's happening in the policy at the moment. The town of KOC, with a population of 17,000, so it's a small town, is situated within a commune, a province, a commune bearing the same name, KOC. The commune comprises several villages with traditional chieftaincies who govern local affairs in their area in accordance with customary justice, customary law. And the lingua franca, and I come back to the language, the lingua franca of this community is Fong, F-A-N-G. Okay, so if you look at the map, you will see that SEMAC, which is hatched, it's the hatched, SEMAC comprises six countries, and our Kie Osi focus, the red dot is Kie Osi, is close to the borders of Equatorial Guinea to its east, and to Gabon to its south. Now, there were historically two impediments that constrained the development of the municipal market of Kiosi, which was established in 1979, specifically to attract people from the other two neighboring countries. These two impediments. In the first place, buyers were confined to a few Gabonese nationals since Equatorial Guinea in the 1980s was not quite at war, but it was, it had serious differences at the, at, at, the, at the government level with Cameroon. It was only in the 1980s that the market was opened to nationals of this country. Before that, they weren't allowed to, to, to enter. In 1985, moreover, Equatorial Guinea, which had currency from the colonial Spanish past, in 1985, Equatorial, Equatorial Guinea joined the CFA franc zone, which means they were using the same currency throughout SEMAC. In the second place, a second market in the region, Abang Mko, if I pronounce it correctly, was constructed in 1992, some four kilometers from the Equatorial Guinea border on the northern side of a river which runs along the border the river Ntem that runs east-west close to the border. The success of this second market did not last long. Repeated breakdowns of the ferry crossing the Ntem River paralyzed road traffic and long waits for the repair of the transport infrastructure linking the market to the borders discouraged traders. In short, traders turned definitively toward the Kie Osi market where land traffic did not pose any major problems despite the state of the roads in the late 1990s, which according to Michel were really not good at all in the 1990s. So, before moving on, let me just give you the new continental policy of AFCFTA, the African <coughs> Continental um, Free Trade Area. The AFCFTA agreement, which, is, which was due to come into effect in June, July 2020, was delayed because of COVID, and it came into effect from the African Union Addis Ababa's point of view on the 1st of January 2021, creating what they call a new dawn of opportunity for trade on the African continent. This includes South Africa and SADC. Intra-African trade has historically been fairly limited at less than 18% of intra-regional trade where you have more than 50% is trade from separate African countries to Europe and to Asia. 
AFCFTA aims to address this by creating the largest free trade area globally, that is the African continent. It plans to connect 1.2 billion people in 54 countries with a combined gross domestic product of about $4 trillion and remove some of the main obstacles to intra-African trade, including weak productive capacities, limited economic diversification, as well as to remove or at least significantly reduce tariffs between countries on the African continent related to intra-African trade. So let me start with um, the way in which Michel uh, addressed the question of the market. There are three themes that he selected, three factors, to try and assess how well a border market is doing. This is the, the reference, if anyone's interested. The presence of both satisfactory market and transport infrastructure, I've already touched upon that, is the first. The second is the presence in the border town of entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs, both sellers as well as buyers, entrepreneurs. Buyers in bulk, also buyers. And then thirdly, the borders need to be relatively porous, thereby providing the traders with business opportunities. Okay, so this is the way in which he went about um, analyzing the border market. The governments of Cameroon and Gabon and later Equatorial Guinea were aware of the challenge of river crossings and inferior road transport by the early 2000s. Technical support was mobilized with a view to making the movement of people, goods and services around KOC more fluid. Roads from KOC into Gabon and into Equatorial Guinea were tarred. Completed in 2005, this infrastructure was financed jointly by the Cameroonian and Gabonese governments on the one hand, and by the European Union under the European Development Fund on the other. So you have tarred roads, you have good, good, good transport. I've, I've visited once just between parentheses. Okay, let's move on to sellers and buyers. There are three main reasons for the attractive reputation of the key or sea market. In the first place, importantly, both Gabon and Equatorial Guinea are oil producing countries. And this has led to higher costs for market commodities than those found in Cameroon. And it has also led to uh, commercial agriculture not having been developed in the same extent as in Southern Cameroon. In the third case, Access to this market has improved over the last two decades. In short, the prices paid for goods in this market are significantly less than comparable prices across the two borders. And most, if not almost all buyers, are cross-border buyers. Most sellers, on the other hand, are Cam of Cameroonian origin and come from the northern and western regions of the country. There is one group called the Bamalike, who are known to be extraordinarily good, a reputation, good mm -hmm. traders. And they've moved down from central Cameroon into the town. Um, the indigenous people, the far speaking people from the local region are also sellers. I'll come back to that. So there are three groups of sellers, so says Michel, that are visible in the market. In the first place, there are vendors, there are sellers from other regions of Cameroon who generally engage in selling manufactured products, whereas locals engaged in agricultural production for sale, and then there are itinerant sellers. There are therefore both wholesalers and retailers in the market, the wholesalers having reasonably sized shops, while the latter, the retailers, sell their goods from boxes or in sheds. Now, Michelle and I discussed the gender issue, and he went and looked at the gender issue. Men monopolize the wholesale sector, sellers, while many women are found in the retail sector, and the main reason given 
was that women find it difficult to raise capital needed for wholesaling. Apart from these two categories, there are also itinerant traders who do not have fixed stalls, but sell their products in wheelbarrows or within easy reach close to the market area. Now, let me just give you one of these tables, just to give you some idea. The table shows that there is some specialization by day of the week of market goods for buyers from Gabon and for buyers from Equatorial Guinea each week. This is particularly for foreign bulk buyers. They come in trucks, they buy wholesale and they sell retail. They arrive in trucks, arriving in vehicles, lorries, cars and so on. In the third column, you can see a list of goods, agricultural goods that are sold by the local sellers Manioc, by the way, is the French word for cassava. You probably know what, what cassava. Um, and manufactured goods sold by the Cameroonians hailing from further north, particularly the Bamileke, at least by reputation. The market, of course, is open every day to everyone and Sundays for locals who can arrive by bicycle or walk or by bus. <coughs> Okay, so let's now go back to the issues that we raised earlier. Are the borders seen to be a resource to sellers and buyers? There are two reasons given by key AOC sellers for this being a resource. Foreign buyers were more likely to be attracted by prices in Cameroon. The location of the market offers foreign clientele tell goods not only in large quantities but at attractive prices and of high quality. Secondly, costs of establishing a market site and of residing in the town, in the small town of Kiosi, are substantially lower than their equivalents in the larger towns and cities of Cameroon. So there is an advantage uh, of locating the market in a small town. I have said nothing so far about tariffs, tariffs being the de de declaration of imports and exports. In 1994, a customs tax policy was agreed to by the members of SEMAC. Goods imported into the customs territory of a member state of SEMAC are deemed to be liable to import duties fixed by the community's customs tariff. It was widely reported to Michel during his research that it is common knowledge to everyone in KOC that this policy is not applied strictly. Okay, so I'm now going to move, as, as, as Stephen mentioned, to the focus that Michel developed regarding ethnicity, and I'm going to point to two different issues. The four language is spoken not only in southern Cameroon, but also in northern Gabon and in eastern Equatorial Guinea. It's a large speech community, if you would like to call it that. Since claims of fraud and of unpaid money loans are common disputes between Cameroonians and foreigners, those that take place between local Cameroonian vendors and local foreign buyers, for speaking, require arbitration, requiring arbitration are often submitted to customary justice. And an example that he followed up on. An Equatorial Guinean buyer had given money to a Cameroonian seller to buy a whole number of bags of onions. The Cameroonian seller had used the money to pay for personal debts rather than delivering the onions. The case was brought to the attention of the chief, the traditional chief of the commune of Kiyosi, who summoned the respondent, the complainant, and his Equatorial Guinean chief counterpart to the chiefdom. During the talks, the seller confessed to wrongdoing and pleaded to the two chiefs for a two-day deadline to return the money for the bags of onions. 
That's an example. The second example is as, in, as, as interesting. I, I visited the market, so I saw what I'm about to tell you. Shared collective identity also plays an important role during the negotiations over prices in the market. One walks through the market and one sees manufactured goods in shops, one sees goods being sold in wheelbarrows, one sees goods being sold in stores on the side of the road, and there are no prices. The price is not on the item or next to the item. So most stores displaying goods for purchase do not include written prices on or next to these goods. Accordingly, negotiations over prices take place regarding almost all of the goods, wholesale and retail. Sellers frequently use introductory words, if not sentences, in the foreign language with the intention of obtaining the indulgence of local buyers to agree to a higher price, and possibly vice versa. Accordingly, it was widely reported that learning the foreign language, even if one is not from the foreign speech community, learning the foreign language seems to have become a requirement imposed on non farm traders to try to have some same chances during price negotiations. Um, Stephen, I'm almost finished. You mentioned ethnicity and smuggling. My next report on Michelle's um, research is regarding smuggling. Traditional smuggling, there are two kinds of smuggling. There's traditional smuggling and there's formal smuggling. These are the terms being used in French by, by the by Michelle. Traditional smuggling is where operators smuggle their goods through indirect routes, thereby bypassing customs offices where they have to pay their tariff. Creeks and pathways, usually on foot and bush tracks, sometimes negotiable by vehicle or by bicycle, that link KOC with Equatorial Guinea on the one hand and with Gabon on the other are many and varied, and they pass through traditional chiefs territories. Formal smuggling concerns transactions that pass through the customs office in such a way as not to declare certain goods. These goods without declaration may be seen and ignored by customs officers, officials or may be hidden from the view by traders. Both forms of smuggling are reported to be widespread in the Kiyosi market. Accordingly, it is extremely difficult for a researcher to assess accurately the proportions of goods that are being imported or exported from the Kiyosi market, and for that matter, the size of annual import tariffs at the Kiyosi border post. Now, you can imagine just putting yourselves into the shoes of um, Michelle Major Major, that it is not that easy finding, uh, obtaining information regarding smuggling, be it either traditional or formal. In one case, speaking to, he speaks fluent Fung, I should have mentioned that, the Michelle. And in one case, there was one customs official to whom he, he spoke, who asked to remain anonymous and he said the following, and this is a translation from the French. Since they are the same families on both sides, they are forced to assist each other during happy events, like weddings, cultural celebrations, births, as well as during unhappy moments, such as funerals. So people are often taken across the border with small or medium-sized shipments of products, that are not very important in defiance of the legislation. Now that's simply, a, I don't know whether I would call it, the case study. So to finish, let's go back to the African continental free trade area. It is clear that trade in the key market is both formal, 
that is visible to border officials and to market managers, as well as informal, invisible to border officials and key or see market managers. A simple definition of informality. It is also clear that the income from border officials and the income for border officials and for traditional leaders through whose tribal land buyers travel will have a part flowing from informal sources. One can talk, but give them different names, but it is clear that their part of the income is from informal sources due to the ethnic factors. <laughs> um, so just to repeat that, it's clear also that the income for border officials and for traditional leaders through whose tribal land buyers travel will also have a part flowing from informal sources. So if we focus on intergovernmental policies coming out of Addis Ababa, where the African Union has its headquarters, on trade and tariffs, these will, by nature of visibility to the states, only involve formal trade. So, as Michel argues, it becomes apparent, therefore, that there needs to be involvement in carrying out the policy at local, at the key or seat market levels of sellers, of buyers, and of customs officials in the application of this new African continental free trade, free trade area policy. Otherwise, he suggests, implementation will be severely curtailed. Okay, so that's to give you some idea of that's Kiosi, Cameroon is there, in, just in Cameroon, that's Gabon, and that's Equatorial Guinea, and two more photographs of the markets, and that's for him, that's not for me. He's saying thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Simon. Um, so let's take each, uh, you take three or four questions at a time, comments, and we've, we've got quite a bit of time. We may even uh, stop at two. We'll see um, how much, how many questions we have. Oh, let's. So, let's, so my question is obviously. Yeah. And can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Lisa. I think you already know me. Uh, but my question is: so this policy, the free trade agreement, how exactly would it impact the area? Given that most of it is already formal slash a form of smuggling, so there's not necessarily a lot of tariffs involved. And secondly, um, so I think borders are also constructed as almost a positive thing, you know, being on the edges of borders. But does he analyze how these borders were formed? Was there any violence in this area? The his history of the border borders, because a lot of African borders have colonial histories. And I think the fact that, you know, there's families separated by them, that the borders themselves become an interesting mm -hmm. site to look at. I think that Okay, any other pressing questions, comments, or one to go ahead? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Simon. And um, it's very interesting, very exciting, different parts of the world and appears very vibrant and so on. I think that the issue of formality and informality and definitions around it is maybe a bit more important than than you're suggesting, right? I mean, um, it's after all um, trading of this nature, um, marketplaces, and so on that led to the. Um, the the coining of the term the informal economy by um, Keith Hart in um, in Africa and and his proposal that um, the informal economy is the African economy 
to a great extent, right? So for me, the the, the um, I think um, I'd be interested also to see what the layers of of formality is also amongst your your three um, uh, um, different categories of traders. So for wholesalers and so on, how are they um, sort of, how do they connect to regulations? Regulations around taxes and so on. They operate as businesses, whereas your retailers are informal traders in our definition. They, they operate as subsistence um, traders, people working for their own survival, not um, to necessarily accumulate profits and buy more stock and resell at the same level than um, your, your wholesalers and so on. Um, so I think that um, your, your, your conclusion around how the, the new agreement needs to um, have an understanding of the levels and extent of informality and formality in this area need to be understood and dealt with. I, I, I think that the extent and how they should consider this lies very much in term in in lies very much in that question about the formal and the informal in this in this context. So, yeah, what I'm saying is that um, there is a sort of definitional, but also contextual question here about what is considered formal and informal. And I mean that that also goes for your for your um, for the findings around legality, extra legality. Do we call it? legal or extra legal, formal or informal. Um, and I think it's in that language that um, sort of the conundrum of this paper is, is, is uh, located. One more. One more. Can you take one more? Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm curious um, in the kind of Price negotiations um, and indeed in disputes, you know, you 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 cr construct or you and Michelle construct a, an insiders outsiders um, around language and to some extent around ethnicity. I'm wondering about other lines of stratification around age, around uh, gender, um, um, around say other kinds of familiarity with the market that that may shape. You know how price is negotiated. Of course, I think language is is, is crucial, and and ethnicity maybe maybe also. But I'm I'm kind of curious about you know who gets the best prices. What are the kinds of um, informal bargaining strategies uh, in Brazil? They talk about Jaitinho. Um, you know, Jeremy Jones writes a very famous, a very uh, interesting paper about Kukia Kia in Zimbabwe, the ways in which people hustle. Um, so I'm curious about that level of um, of kind of everyday life at the market. Um, I'm also curious about the the way that commodities and and wares at the market are displayed. Um, um, I'd like to know a bit more about, you know, is everything is everything just laid out in sacks, um, you know, with the signs of what of of what's being sold? How much uh, attention is paid to the particular display of certain things? Does that affect price uh, and so on and so forth? Um, um, so I think it's a, I think it's really interesting. I think there's also questions about formality and borders that um, that I'd like to think about a bit more. But um, but thank you. It's it, it, the research sounds really really quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take another one, or you want to? I would not like to take another one right now. <laughs> 
I've got a lot. No, well, thank you very much for the for the comments. Let me let me let me move backwards, if I may. I've made a few. Bernard, I would agree completely that 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 certainly there are a whole number of other factors which he was aware of, of Michel, that um, that that influence prices. He said the one other one which was important, which is in a sense um, um, obvious, was that the more the same buyer arrived, either for uh, manufactured goods or for bulk, that is wholesale, the more trust was built and the more there would be an advantage in terms of the buyer negotiating price with the seller. In other words, it was the trust. And then he said that was also part of the language. If that person was a phone speaker, it was e it would be easier to get to this trust. Um, I mean, that was one of the one of the one of the issues. The second issue with regard to gender, and I think that has to it has to do with what you, you put, is that women were not well. There were very few women that were wholesalers. When you're in the market, and these are some of the photographs, you have shops for manufactured goods that are mainly for manufactured goods, having people from the north, Cam Cameroonians from the north of Bamidike who, who would be run them. You would have shops for, for, for bulk um, agricultural goods, and then you would have small stalls, as we see sometimes in South Africa, and you would have literally wheelbarrows. Um, you had a measure of a division between between the Bamilike and the northerners and then the locals being the sellers. And then with regard to women, when he went a second time and he actually tried to get more information, he found that one of the reasons why women were not able to buy to buy uh, to, to, to raise funds, because you have to raise funds to be able to to lease the shop. You need you need you need furniture in the shop, and you need maybe advertisements of what it is that you can buy. They they found it difficult to raise funds because women found it difficult to raise funds rather than men from the local sources, including the local kind of informal, semi-formal banks. But it was it's also because, with regard to the wholesalers, a number of the buyers said we want to negotiate with a man. We would prefer to negotiate with the man than with the woman. So there were there were two levels at which there was discrimination of a gender sense. Um, on the formal and the informal, I mean, I agree, I agree completely, and I I think he was aware of that. This, as I said, this is a very a very simple definition of formal. I, I don't know that much. The, we, we, I presented this paper to a group at Stios about three months ago on AFCFTI, who, who, who studied it. And they said it still is not clear how tariffs, particularly tariffs, are going to be decreased. It's not clear. I, I, I read this paper and they said the, 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 particularly the issue of smuggling is interesting because people have invested in smuggling. Chiefs have invested in smuggling, and smuggling only takes place if you want to try and avoid tariffs. Otherwise, why smuggle? So, so the whole issue of informal and formal, I think, is 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 is, is much more difficult to identify. I am I, giving the, the reply they gave. I think that the AFCFTA CFTA has got to still address this issue more clearly. And then if I may come to the first question, which is the most, I mean, the most important issue in the first place is the AFCFTA is not only in a region. They're interested in how um, maize from South Africa can be sold to Cameroon. Now, at this point, you're going out of SADC and you're going into SEMEC. So, to an extent, this example is seen to be a positive. To an extent, a positive example about what should happen across the continent. Now, that would mean for us, as it was raised, that would mean for us that if someone has got a visa from Sudan, she may enter South Africa. 
or visa from Zimbabwe. I mean, it's, you've got free entry if you've got a visa within CEMEC. And part of the aim is to have free flow of labor as well as free, free flow of goods with, to an extent, some tariffs for certain of them. So at the moment, it's being applied within the regions. And in within the regions, as, you, as you're implying in your question, this is not that bad an example of how CF, AFCFTA um, a, a policy ought to work. But the moment you get out of that, those six countries, and you go to Nigeria, and you go to Kenya, and you go to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, all of whom are very close by, but they're not in Zemek, there you've got a completely different formally approach about tariffs. The tariffs are much higher, supposed to be, and about entry. So, in, in a sense, your, 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 um, your, 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 I mean, kind of what, what could be all right with you. Your impression that this is reasonably good, con it's conforming reasonably well, I think is a good one. Your question on borders and history, the best I can do is the following, is that um, if one goes back to colonial times, Cameroon was German until the end of the First World War. Cameroon, K-A-M-R-U-N. And then it was taken over, rather like German Southwest Africa was, it was taken over um, on trust by the French and the British. And they, they were not particularly interested in the borders down south. They were certainly interested in the borders with Nigeria. The borders with Nigeria have changed. On Gabon, Gabon was part of French Equatorial Africa. And it, it seceded. Um, so you've got Congo Brazzaville and you've got Gabon. That was part of Equatorial Africa. And you seceded. And as far as I, I know, um, there were never any changes of borders. Where your question is directly relevant is with Equatorial Guinea. The history of Equatorial Guinea is that during the slave trade, the Portuguese, in the slave trade, the Portuguese wanted to give Africa a little area where they could also have their own slave trade. That's how the, the, the Spanish got hold of it. The Portuguese said, here, you can have it for slave trade. And that continued right through. There were some changes right through. And there has been, there, there still are major differences regarding where the border between Equatorial Guinea and Cameroon and Gabon are, particularly because the, the, the Spanish never used Equatorial Guinea for anything other than a, a port earlier with regard to slave trade. <coughs> so that border is the one which is, which is still disputed. And as I mentioned in the beginning, Michel made it clear that until about 1980-85, there were actual, there were actual um, um, conflict um, um, between soldiers from the two sides regarding the border. It was only recently that it is essentially being, being incorporated into CEMAC. It's essentially been taking French rather than Spanish as its, its main language. And it's taking the CFA, which is a French colonial currency, which is being continued post-colonial. So again, that question is a good one. There, were, there certainly were on the Equatorial Guinea side, um, difficulties that can be taken back to the colonial times on the border. Yeah. So, okay, so then what I understand is would the um, implications of the new free trade agreement actually affect this port? Because then if you can bring in goods further away for cheaper, that might undermine this very, you know, the, the, the way things have been structured. Or is that, because I'm trying to figure out how the town fits into this free trade agreement, or is it just not necessarily going to be implicated or yes, um, affected? And then another question is, so how do people concede the border then with the contestation? So they, do, they, do they feel like it's a valid border, meaning that then you can go to customs, or do they actually see it as, you know, my family lives right there, so what's the point? Mm -hmm. and that's why smuggling is such a big thing. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think I think it's it's what's the point in the sense of free flow of people and free flow of small goods. But when it when it gets to when it gets to um, um, bulk wholesale and manufactured, there there is a demand for tariffs to be paid, and then you can try and negotiate your tariff both in the market as well as on the border. I mean, to give you a comparison, a comparison which I know little about, because um, my family grew up very close to the Swaziland border, the Eswatini border. There are more Swat Eswatini speakers in South Africa than in Eswatini, on both sides of the border. And there, there is, there is at the, what, what I would call informal, but I mean, at the at at the at the at the, at the level not seen through your formal um, data collectors. There is a whole number a whole number of people that are moving across within that area without papers and exchanging exchanging when there are happy times and when there are sad times, the extended family. <coughs> So you've got that in a number of places, including in South Africa and Eswatini. But the moment it becomes it, it becomes sending motor cars or computers or bulk mails, at that point it becomes an issue of tariff of of being able to identify it statistically. It goes up to the Department of Statistics and Pretoria, and it's and it's then used in your your statistics. At least that's the way I think of it. Let's take another round, that's why. And so how both you and Michelle are conceptualizing the economy, I wanted to query the some of the critiques that the AFCFTA has received. So once again, if one is looking at Samir Amin's work about the integration of African economies within the global economy, and that the way in which bodies and passages of goods are regulated by a much larger economy. So we all know that in Africa, for the most part, a lot of countries in Africa will struggle with the public expenditure. So if you have free tariffs, so if you have like free movement of goods, which is the ideal, the ideology behind it is fantastic, but you need a strong, you need a strong state, financial state in order to support the exchange of goods without tariffs. And that's a virtual impossibility because there's not because of the, 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 the iron fist of the global economy around the neck of Africa is is almost impossible to try and breathe through that because there's no ways because of the history of integration of Africa's economies into the global economy. It's a complete service state. The continent is in service to the economies of Europe, and that hasn't changed ever. And, and, and with the, the integration of these kinds of, sort of new forms of, of economic organizing, structural adjustment, IMF, and all of that, it, it's, it's a little bit redundant. And so what you see is you have people labeling exchange in terms of informality and formality, when I think the larger question should be, should be how how are these kinds of markets uh, created and sort of uh, explicitly both explicitly and implicitly implicitly regulated by European markets? It's fantastic for for the European markets. It's, it's fantastic to have these levels of informality and smuggling and things like that. But these are all kinds of just sort of catchphrases that we use to describe a much larger rot, which starts really with European economies and how those have been shaped uh, by the, the, the strength of Africa's resources. I so, mean, if, I, if I may reply, we will see the two uh, reports. Sorry, two there was that, that was just the, sort of the preamble for my question, which is ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in how you guys are in, in, in how you guys are formalizing a, a question what's the larger what is the larger question that you're asking through this this data that you gathered and reflecting on the, the new policies what is the larger question is it a question that you're suggesting that this is just a replication or i i just want to I want to hear what the question is 
Thanks, Simon. I just following the debate, <clears throat> but some of it's familiar because I also work with markets, you know, anthropology of the stuff. I think to piggyback an FY, that is a, gen, a simple, it seems to me, one can't do a study like this without investigating the CFA, the nature of currency. And I've been doing quite a bit of reading lately in the last few months on, you know, what happened during the colonial period in South Asia. And it ties up with the anthropology of money. One can't understand economic practice without understanding questions like sovereignty and money and borders, I think, like those. Uh, but that's just a general thing. My actual in the question was, I've got this one book here, it's called Jungle Passports by Malini Sur, S-U-R. It's quite a brilliant book. You guys should probably read it. But the one thing, so it's about the India-Bangladesh border, heavily militarized, very non-porous in theory. But even in the midst of these kind of fence borders, people are constantly moving. And I think contrary to what you suggest, they are not moving only on the side, they're moving straight through the middle of the, of, of the border. I've seen this myself. I've moved through into Mozambique without a passport. It's very easy to cross. And this is formal, right? She talks about people on trucks. You are suggesting that trucks are somehow formal and there's no smuggling. No, it's happening on trucks. Massive movement of goods across this, that, that border that you're talking about through the formal channel, but which is happening, you know, smuggling. And I think it links to what Ilza says, there's a sense among these people, even today, 60 years later, that this is not justified. That the border, because of kinship, because of other kinds of relations. So I wonder if that's an ethnographic question. Um, the, the, the second thing I was thinking about, you're talking about free trade agreements. Now these things usually are, you know, is that imagined by policy makers of these things. They not often, you know, look what happened during COVID with the lockdown, you know. We live in South Africa, everybody's in South Africa. It's quite obvious to anybody that a lockdown is going to make a whole lot of people suffer. But the guys that make policy are in another world, you know, of ideals and all kinds of things. So there's something going on where I agree also what she said. Are they against it? That's not right. Are these people actually against these kind of things? Because often the free trade actually creates more formalization. Mm -hmm. And the neoliberal is not a shrinking state. That's a false argument. Neoliberalism is the strongest state promotes certain kinds of trade. Mm -hmm. The next point was just about Parker Shipton. Because I heard you speaking about trust and language. And I think this guy is not, he's a very famous anthropologist of Africa. He's not being read enough. Have you heard of this guy, Parker Shipton? He writes on entrustment. And he's a brilliant way of understanding trust. And I think one can think about, yes, of course, language, you know, you Gender, all these things, but his understanding of what one could call the pragmatics of trust, actually looking at the embodied ways in which this thing is developed over time, certain kinds of gifting. In fact, he has one interesting insight that trust is established simply through a successful trade. You know, there's a sense of risk at that moment. But I deal with you, and then you pay me, cool, so we do it again, you know, and it builds up over time. So there's this performative aspect um, happening. With just on the questions. Right. Thank you. Um, on, just to follow up, I think uh, on one of the questions that F4 raised, I mean, um, and, and back to one of the answers you gave, you know, it seems to me that it seems to me that the kind of what's coming out is that that some of the some of the kind of goods and the you know the retail goods that move between the borders. There's not that much concern about. Uh, it's at the level of wholesale, or at the at the level of bulk, certain commodities or or, or or certain quantities of commodities. At that point, tariffs come in. At that point, maybe things need to be need to be smuggled or moved across. And I wonder how those might link into the bigger the the bigger kind of macro kind of global political economy that F was pointing to in terms of. Where, which commodities are touching a nerve? Which commodities are seen as disruptive of a kind of global net and need to be regulated and taxed and so on, and which are not, right? So as we, as you, I mean, I infer that some of it's about scale, some of it's about you know how far are things moving, maybe distance, um, and some of it might have to do with the very particular commodities itself. 
So, I mean, I'm wondering if you can kind of give more detail on that, and, and, and that might, you know, might be helpful. Okay, Stephen, may I go? Yes, in, in relation to that. <laughs> Oh, Do you? Okay, let's, let's <laughs> take yours. I think it's all linked to your side. I was also concerned with um, the whole idea about an informal economy, which we know is strong, um, and this formalization within a new liberal approach to managing the economy, really, um, and that this the smuggling is really a reaction towards saying, but we're not registered, we don't pay tax, and we're not going to, and we don't, so we don't belong to these rules. It's not our rules. Um, and maybe if it's also in links to what Bernard was saying, the smuggling is it your your smaller tradesmen, because I, I would gather it's not the big um, bulk buyers and so forth. It will be your typical informal kind of tradespeople that would also probably be the smugglers and the the way of thinking is actually said but we don't buy into this formal system and 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 obviously the government wouldn't like that but the, that problematic um, nature of this type of trade which is for me something that's you know very interesting and i um sure that he was very aware of it and you while doing this research so yeah just that comment probably yeah. is this maybe the last round we'll see um, no, I don't have a very different angle on this. I mean, I think the comments that have emerged, the, it seems like the borders and the tariffs coming to visibility around scale, distance, specific commodities, as Bernard mentioned. Um, and I, I'm wanting to know when else the border comes into visibility, what, 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 what other processes do that kind of work so, so where, is there investment in policing the border in, in other ways or or not so we, we've seen how whether it's the physical borders that come into visibility maybe it's, it's there's not policing there but there is there's a tariff that comes into visibility are there other ways Okay, can, can I mean, let me start with that, Steve. I mean, there is there is a reasonably large um, literature on the border as resource in Africa. If one goes up to Bay Bridge, I mean, you've got all sorts of businesses around Bay Bridge because it's a border. Uh, the border, I know, I knew, and it was it was raised by this conference at Stias, is the border between Togo and um, Ghana, and you've got a large, you've got a large city on the Togo, in fact, the capital city, Lome, and on this side, you've got Aflao, and it is one of the major investment areas for local. So you've got the border as, as a resource because you've got to, to have some form of management and financial management in crossing. So that would be that would be my answer about why you have the importance of the border there, which is the border as a resource. And it's around the town, it's not elsewhere, it's around the town of Kios. And then I mean with regard, first of all, I'll answer some of what you said with regard to all of your questions. What uh, maybe I should have made this clear in, 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 in starting. I must apologize on behalf of Michelle. Michelle did his research. In 2018, 2019, just before the beginning of COVID, the AFCFTA was not on the on the map at all. The AFCFTA was supposed to have been implemented in 2020, and it came in in 2021. So what I have presented here is the addition that he and I have put into his thesis regarding AFCFTA. Maybe I should also say, in terms of the question raised by one of the two honor students, is that after this paper was presented to this group that are researching from both um, from both Nigeria and from Scotland, the AFCFTA, 
They took the paper and they're going to be contacting Michel because they think that this example of his thesis would be a very good example to give people who are trying to <coughs> approach the CF, AFC FDA across regions. I mean, let me understand, underline that. There is quite a lot of free trade and there is quite a lot of free movement across countries in regions, not us. I mean, we the worst clearly in Africa in terms of movement of people. So all of your questions on the AFC FDA, I mean, I'm, I'm giving answers that he didn't research this. This has come afterwards. <coughs> and then if I may ask about If I forgot, just you had one major question. I, I forgot what it was. <laughs> the question. What is the question? What is the question? Oh. What is the question? Okay, that's right. What is the question? So, having having said all of that, this is also to answer to everyone is that I mean I'm not an economist, and Michelle is not an economist, and we certainly were aware that when he was looking at how we had a long discussion about whether it should call, be called ethnicity, whether it should be called ethno-linguistic ethno identity, how that plays a role in the market. So it was socio-anthropology or anthropo-sociological, sociology, sociological rather than economic. That would be that would be the first point. After that, with AFC, FDA, and the environment, it, it's become much more political economy. So the main question he asked in his thesis was what role, if any, and what came out was the font, what I call now the font, speech community, is really important in understanding how uh, a, a number of these economic transactions take place. So that would be the main, the main, the main question in his thesis, quite clearly. The main question here is why would this be an interesting example to the nascent AFC FTA, which is from what I read. I mean, we have a we have a group in in, in, in Cape Town called Tralek. I don't know whether you know Tralek. Tralek is doing weekly research on, on AFC FTA. Uh, there is a lot of confusion, and there are people who have decided not to become involved. Nigeria has said no, thank you. So it's not as if it's 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 being What's rolled up. Oh, then there was one last question, which is I think a very important one that you asked before, and that is what he did find out. This is about the the, the, the the dominant markets in the in in the West and increasingly in the East, from Japan and from China. Your point was completely well taken. He he pointed to the fact that the Equatorial Guinea is a port of entry for manufactured European goods like spades, like forks, also for European and sometimes Chinese computers. And they're using this to come through and then they can use the free trade within this region, having made their profits by coming in. So the issue, and this is not in, in his paper, the issue in my mind, given that example, is that as AFCFTA takes place, tariffs on markets beyond Africa have to become stricter and better run. Otherwise, the free trade will be to the, to the advantages of markets in the East and in the West and not to Africa. So that point, I think, is that point is being made by people, and I think it's very well taken. And he, he had an example of that. I mean, he didn't analyze it the way I just had, but he said, "You've got, you've got. Where do the manufactured goods that are sold at Kiosi come from? Some of them come through Cameroon. Some of them come through um, 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 Equatorial Guinea, and then go into Cameroon, and then are sold in the Cameroon Kiosi market. So clearly, that is a major." issue regarding, I mean, let's call it the economic heritage of colonialism toward two or three European countries during the first half of the, of the 20th century. So, I mean, I think that point is an important point. Okay, thank you. 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 Thank
Can, can I, and please, if I may, and you covered everybody's. Yeah, if I make a last point, I really yeah. would appreciate it if someone could send an email to Michelle, not me, and say merci. Mm. We will. <laughs> but I have a question about the implications for SADC. Is this a long response for the SADC even? Is it thinking about what's going on there, or is it so parochial that we don't think of the implications? Because what we see now is an attempt to tighten the borders, particularly in relation to Zimbabwe and, and other countries. Just a question of clarification. No. Who's pushing the AFCDA? Where does it where does it come from? Who's the who backs it? Who's putting it on the table? And why should people then sign up? Where does it come from? It is such a traveling yes. model. Right? <laughs> I was to ask about you think that these people the who are the AC, uh, the AC, the, the people the free get, they are saying tariffs have to become better run, otherwise the gain will accrue to Europe and China. No, that's what I was saying. What is it you said? But what how, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm failing to understand this. <laughs> I mean, the AFCFTA, I'll try and answer, but I don't know very much about it. The AFCFTA, as I understand it, is saying there are 54, maybe 55 countries on the African continent. Mm -hmm. If one looks at world trade, the inter-country, interstate trade from Africa is up to 85% foreign countries. And if one, if one takes the economic theory that trade is to the advantage of both sides, then this is clearly African trade is benefiting extraordinarily other, the East and the West and North America and the Americas, um, as well as um, not allowing the double benefits to accrue to countries within Africa. So let us try and change the proportion of inter, in, intracontinental trade into Africa. Yes. Um, and I think if you also follow the, the crumbs back, so Kaya's question is, is you know, who's pushing it? It's the AU, we all know, is a puppet of the World Bank, and it's the World Bank who are also pushing this agenda of the sustainable development goals of eradicating poverty in Africa. Mm -hmm. So this is all back to this question of let's deal with poverty in Africa. And the World Bank is pushing much of them financing a lot of, of, of the AFCFTA um, because their understanding is and this is what Africa needs is free movement of goods within Africa, which of course will benefit other markets that are much stronger in the global economy. Africa's, Africa's economies are not strong in the global economy. And if you free the movement, like you were exactly as you were saying, um, it just this means that things become unregulated internally, which, you know, I mean, yeah. I would characterize the African Union as being deeply influenced by where the money, where the funds come from, including the, the, the um, International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. I wouldn't characterize it as the... Puppet? Puppet. Oh. Isn't that not one of the same thing? <laughs> I, would, I, I would say that there are people there who really would like to try and promote intra-African trade to the benefit of Africa. And I mean, it, from what economics I do use, I think it would be to the advantage of, of Mozambique and of Zimbabwe and of Zambia and Namibia and, 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 and Angola and Iswatini and the Sutu in South Africa, if we had greater trade allowed taking place here, maybe to the to, to the advantage particularly of the more industrialized and that's South Africa. I mean I'm saying I'm saying it's not it's not all black it's not all black and white either or that's all I'm trying to say. But again let me just underline in terms of in terms of Michelle is that this is not Michelle's research was done prior to this whole debate and maybe this is a, a really interesting topic beyond the economics of it. 
because we don't have the economic um, interests here, of looking at what the AFCFTA is happening at the moment. And you've got Tradec. Tradec is one of the better researched, um, res better researching research bodies about Africa. And, uh, are, there, are there any further questions? Please, Shalit. Yeah, I think it's interesting what you're suggesting because, you know, there's also this, there's been a pushback against this kind of, you know, idea of Africa as informal. You know, Keith Hart himself has gone back and <coughs> realized this is ridiculous because this thing got taken up by the World Bank and all the people and it became a kind of a neoliberal show, right? Africa doesn't need, need development. India doesn't do it, also in Asia. You know, they don't need development. All they need is free trade, and somehow because they are resilient and resourceful, you know. And I see lots of, lots of agency. Yeah, no, it's been more than agency. It's like a it's like a phenomenology of the African mm -hmm. subject. Yeah, if you read the work of Jane Gaia, I'm sure you mentioned it. But it's very deep. <laughs> Jane Gaia thinks that this is the Africa. Yeah. This yeah is but I think I mean I think there's a difference with with, with, with the AFCFTA is not saying that there should be free trade yeah, yeah. at all. Mm. It's, it's saying that it should be free trade, particularly within mm. the African continent, to the advantage of the African continent, so as yeah. to an extent to try and avoid mm. the. But in order to what I'm trying to one of the critiques of the AFCFTA is that if you have no tariffs and they you rely on the state for. For, for expenditure to support those economies. And the, there's not enough money to support, there's not enough like tertiary money to support the bolstering of uh, of, of, of collapsing of tariffs. Even with, even if ideologically, which is also part of the, pra the, the, the ontology of pan Africanism, this is precisely what it is. Let's let's focus and, and look in within within our own borders. What are our resources? How can we exchange? Part of the African Union is the, is the AU passport. Why has it the AU passport not been rolled up? Because it just doesn't make sense financially. It just it increases government expenditure, and that's one of the biggest fallouts of, of any of these so-called nation states in Africa. Is that there isn't enough money. The fiscal spending is just way. Well, there's debt. Well, I mean, let me give you let me give you a response which if Michelle was sitting out here. Yeah. I give you, and you would say, "Well, look at Kiyosi." KOC is working reasonably well. It's got free movement. It's got some tariffs, but I mean, many of those tariffs are not fully paid. And it's to the advantage of those in KOC and to the advantage of, of buyers in Gabon and in Equatorial Guinea, Guinea and sellers in. So it is, it is a sort of example because it is it moving toward not free trade globally. A measure of trade. No, no, I think one needs to take it as a serious experiment and and actually perhaps more research to question what you're suggesting and maybe it's not what it's it's not delivering what ought to be. But I mean the idea seems to be they're tariffs at scale. There's there's it's not but aren't a free for but all, aren't there huh? experiments like that really with economic chaos in so and so it's also um, border towns, uh, towns bordering on the border of Mexico and, and the U.S. Where yeah, there's please. also uh, a, a level of free trade, economic um, processing, sure. um, uh, um, abrogation of labor laws, those kinds of things. Yeah, I but I mean, what one doesn't need to promote it to say, let's look at it seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's what I find fascinating that yes. Michelle and yourself are taking this very seriously. And I mean, the analysis can come out in the way you suggest thing, or, or maybe not. I mean, to open up the possibility that it doesn't fit all the other scripts that we've got. But I mean, it requires a real uh, interrogation of the empirical work, and, and maybe it does fall. Reproduce a script, but maybe it doesn't. But I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking we won't discuss it now because I think we've probably reached that point. It's been reduced. You gave a shorter presentation than usual. 
you're, you cut to the chase, you're normal for 14 minutes, you did the 30 minutes. <laughs> so we, we've had a good discussion, unless there are final questions or comments on them. We've got the time, so. Thank you and congratulate, please congratulate Michelle. I hope you'll, you'll listen to the presentation and yes. Um, so we'll, we'll have our next seminar, I think on the what on the 20, 20 uh, the chair. <laughs> next uh, seminar on the 25th. No, the 24th is the start. Yeah. We'll let you know when the next, the next one is on the first, but Stephen has to tell us who's presenting because he hasn't done it yet. I know who's presenting. <laughs> tell us the information. <laughs> so, Simon, Michelle, thank you very much for Merci. a lot to, to think about. Merci. Mm -hmm.